Hi, I'm Chris Charla. I'm the head of ID at Xbox at Microsoft, and I'm excited to host this episode of the Game Maker's Notebook with Andrew Scholdice, where we're going to talk about Tunic, the process of making games, and of course, secrets. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, welcome. Hello. How's it going? Uh, uh, it's super good here. It's sunshiny, doing a podcast. What could be better? Absolutely. Well, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, so excited to get into this and talk about your history, talk about Tunic, and just, just learn. Um, but let's start at the beginning. What, what was your first game? What was the first game you ever played? Ooh, that's a good question. It was probably... Super Mario Brothers. I mean, that's the one that sticks in my head. My uh, my family had an Intellivision that might have might have been a precursor to that, but the one that I have strong memories of is probably Super Mario Brothers. Cool. And then I think for like everybody who who works in the game industry, re regardless of the first game you played, and maybe it is Super Mario Brothers, there was the game that got you hooked on games. Like, when did you become you know somebody who was really into this form of entertainment? Uh, I think it was it was basically around that era, and I mean this is maybe relevant later in the conversation as well. But I had next door neighbors that had video games, and like they had a, I think a Commodore sixty four in the basement, and they had a Game Boy and uh, some you know like more Nintendo games than I had for sure. And so a lot of my exposure to those games was sort of look, watching over shoulders and like reading instruction manuals and stuff like that and just sort of you know speculating on what could be in the game as opposed to you know getting really good at doing the jumps right or whatever oh that's awesome and yeah what in that era like the super mario era the nes era there wasn't the same level of um accessibility to how to play a video game or to find out about a video game. It was more sort of a cult schoolyard. Do, do you think that was something that, that you were really a big part, was a big part of your life back then? Yeah, I think so. The The idea of sharing things that you found and hearing things about video games that, and, and you know, when someone describes something to you, it wasn't just like, oh, let me bring it up on my phone and I'll show you what I mean. They would describe a video game to you and you needed to use your stupid child imagination to like try and come up with what this would look like. And of course it was much grander than anything that actually existed. So when you know you, or you're reading through a, a, a book from the library, that's like how to win at video games. And you're reading about, you know, whatever, uh, uh, adventures of Lolo or something. And you're reading it and you're like, Whoa, this sprawling adventure with gems and cool monsters and stuff. And you know, it's a, it's a, puzzle game in that example, right? But your your mind is just going to, you know, fill in the gaps. And um, I love that. That's awesome. And and when did you first um, start making games? So I started thinking about making games a long time ago. Like, like when I was a child, I, I thought, okay, in order to write a story, you need a blank pad of paper. Okay, so in order to make a video game, you must need a, a blank uh, uh, floppy disk. And so I was like, I, I need blank floppy disks so I could make a video game. And I don't know what I was expecting, that you'd like put it in the computer and be like, here's your complete interface for building video games. Um, and so I was, I was really, I was perplexed by this. And I think somebody told me like, no, you need to learn a programming language. And uh, again, you know, idiot child, went to the library and started getting books on uh, like basic and read through those and like got a pretty good understanding of, of that without ever actually writing a line of basic until I realized that our 386 could do that. It had this thing called QBasic on it. And I was like, the, the world was suddenly my oyster at that point, right? Um, and I, I don't think I made anything especially good uh, when I was a child, um, you know, like maybe... Uh, you know, pick pick the right number, high or lower, sort of games like that. But I remember later when I was in, you know, junior high school, high school, you know, building text adventures in QBasic and little action games and things like that. Um, so I've been been at it for a little while now. That's awesome. Do do any of those text adventures still exist? I found a, a few of my very old 
Q Basic action games. There's some like Q Basic revival uh, community out there. I forget what it's called. It's like QB64 or something like that. I forget. Um, and so you could run these old things. I forget how I found them. It must have been like on an old floppy disk or something or a backup CD that I made from having carried it for it. Anyway, yeah, they still exist. I don't know if the text adventure does. That would be a very cool thing to see if I could dig up though. That's a lot cool. of, maybe it's maybe some similarities there with tunic you know like exploring a world finding a mysterious fountain what's it for i i would love to see it sort of the prehistory of uh <laughs> of, of tunic would be really really neat to see so when did you did you did you go to college or how did you become sort of a professional uh game maker professional um i yeah i went to um college doing like web stuff and then after that thought uh, I want to get a degree. And so I did a honors degree in computer science and was going to go into like, uh, not game stuff, but there was a computer animation course and I was introduced to, um, glut, which is this extremely basic, like, I would like to put OpenGL on the computer screen, please sort of interface, um, written in like C or something. And, uh, that made me feel a lot like those old basic days where it was just like hey, tell the computer what you want it to do and it will have a window and you can draw stuff on it um and that was very exciting and i met people there that were working at a company you know that eventually started making hidden object games and i started working there and worked on hidden object games and eventually thought to myself well you know i've made some game jam games for fun and that was really good and, and people started asking me are you going to make something on your own um and at a certain point, I thought, well, if I if I don't if I don't do that now, I will always wonder what could have happened if I if I didn't, you know, bite the bullet and go out on a limb and and a third analogy. Um, so yeah, that was the point where I said, you know what, I'm I'm quitting this job and I'm gonna make a video game. That's awesome. And you you mentioned game jams. Were you doing just like local game jams? Did you do like train jam? Like how did how did this start? Yeah, I did. Um, uh, Ludum Dare was one that I did a few times and had a lot of fun with. And then there were some local ones uh, as well. Um, and of course, uh, Train Jam was was a very cool thing that I've done many times now. And I think I think the first one that I did might have been just as I was starting work on Tunic or, or just before. Um, and that was definitely a moment where I met uh, just a huge pile of very cool people. Um, I think it, yeah, it might've been just after I started. Cause I remember going there and asking people like, how do I become a part of this community? How do I get involved? How do I interact with all these people? Um, and, uh, Israel Wallach who runs train jam was one of the people that, that helped a lot with that. I remember. How, how was that process of, you know, people always ask and people ask me and I'm sure they ask you like, how do I become an indie developer? And, you know, my answer is, is sort of start typing, then you're then you are one, but 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 it, it that's not really true, right? That's sort of a flip answer. Like how how did you like how did that actually happen? Like how did you find out about Train Jam? How did you decide that this was a community that you wanted to be part of? And I'd love to know more about how you sort of you know got into it. You know, fr from my perspective, you you sort of sprang forth, you know, in a in a corner of the indie mega booth with this game that everybody was, you know, five deep looking at. But what's the, you know, what how did you go from, you know, work a day job making hidden object games to to that? Uh it you you're right that it's a bit of a flip answer to say start typing and now you are, but I think that that it is it, it's still good advice because I think that's how it started. Like thinking back, that's sort of how it started. It's um, uh, t type like, hey, in indie games. And I found, I think the like TIG source or something and started, you know, made an account there, talked to some people there, realized, oh, okay, um, people get together at uh, GDC and there's, there's some folks who hang out there. And here's a community that's doing sort of, you know, weird month long game jams. Let me do that. And you meet a person or two there. And so if you're fortunate enough to be able to go to an event, you've got a person to talk to. And, and then maybe if you've made a few cool things and have some followers that when you say, Hey, I'm working on this thing, it, it gets 
um, spread around in that community a little bit. And then you've got someone who's saying, hey, I work on the business side of games. Would you like some help with you? And it, it is it is a, as it, it's an iterative process. It's, there's no, you're, you're right that it's a, a flip answer in that it's not a surefire thing. Um, but the iterative process of being yourself, getting to know people, uh, being interested in what other people are doing um, and engaging with communities, it's all, it all sort of like builds up. And I don't, I don't know if this is good advice. It's it, to me, it feels like what helped me do that. And who knows if that's still relevant today, but I think generally speaking, you know, becoming involved with other people uh, is, is a valuable process. Cool. And what was the reception when you, when you went on your first train jam, for example, like what, how was the, you know, with, with the, I don't know what to call them, the famous indies or whatever. Like, what was, how was the reception? Uh, I, I, people are just people, I guess, is the main thing. Um, and most folks uh, in this industry, and in particular, I think that specific sort of indie games corner of the, the video games industry uh, uh, as a whole are really friendly. Most of the time when I talk to people who exist outside this sphere and you talk about, oh, I'm working on a project, um, you might get things like, well, did you patent your idea? Did you, did you lock down all your trademarks? Like, don't, don't tell anybody about anything. Make them sign all, it's like, that's not really how the community works. It's about saying, hey, I'm working on this goofy thing. Do you wanna see? And so the, you know, the, the people here love what they're doing. And so they love to talk to other people and help other folks as well. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, and it's a it's a really um, it, it's a really valid point. I think the 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 sort of like startup mentality of like patent everything, tell no one anything, versus the indie game mentality of like the way you actually protect the idea is you show it to as many people as possible because then it's everybody knows it's your idea. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess it's, that's how it's an like... interesting it's a, uh, you know an interesting thing when. You decided to to leave and 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 go indie and 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 uh, and and you know take your shot at making a game. How much of Tunic was formed in your head at that point? Basically, zero actual concrete implementation. Like actu actually, zero concrete implementation. It was like, all right, first day, you, you know, new new Unity project go. Um, but thinking back there was definitely this sort of like ambient soup of ideas uh that had been following me around for many years and it it didn't have a shape or even really a name it was just this idea of making a game about mystery and discovery and question marks you know you know i found a weird thing i don't know what that's all about and and slowly peeling back layers of understanding uh, reference points on that being games like, uh, I mean, the the Legend of Zelda is one that comes up a lot. Where you know, oh, it's full of secrets. There's secrets on on every screen, but also uh, Fez as a game where it appears to be one thing on the start and slowly reveals itself to have more than you thought. Uh, it's hidden just under the surface. That sort of like, you know, whether it's a bombable wall or a, a, a secret in Fez, it's that, that it was here the whole time sort of feeling, uh, which I love. And it's, yeah, I, it has come up enough in talking about the game and thinking about it that I think, um, wait, this was here the whole time is sort of like the catchphrase of the game in my mind. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I hear a lot from people that you're able to do things right at the beginning of Tunic that you would never expect. And I don't know. I'm not. I love the game and I love the exploration, but I don't think I was smart enough to to find any of those things. But I, I love the fact that you reference Fez because that is the the vibe that I, I, certainly for me and I think for a lot of other people that you get where you're exploring a world that you just don't understand and then it just sort of slowly comes in. Um, what um, how long did you work on Tunic before that first reveal at uh, Indie Mega Booth? That was 2016, is that right, I think? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'd been working on it for about a year and a half at that point, I think. Uh, so I had um, you know, built some combat prototypes and started work on the world and had a bunch of mechanics together and then went to a, uh, I guess you call it like an incubator program 
called Stugan, which is a, a Swedish program where a small number of developers who are working on their own projects uh, go to this uh, cabin in the woods, basically. It's a, a, a ski resort, but in summer uh, in, in Sweden, and all get together and work on video games there together. And I was fortunate enough to do that. Um, it was very cool. But right after that, like literally fly from Sweden to Seattle, uh, was the game's very first PAX. And so um, I had the, uh, it was uh, very lucky to have Felix Kramer on board. They helped uh, sort of help all of that go smoothly and had that first real experience of, wow, gosh, people are into this feeling at that first PAX where, yeah, like you said, people were um, extremely into it and like lined up and ready to, to play and watch. And I think part of that was uh, me not having any idea what I was doing because I thought, well, I'll, I'll just let people play the game, right? And it turns out that's a bad way to do a PAX demo because um, people will just sit down and play your game. And so, and if it's a, if it's a cool game, maybe you'll have a lineup, but you know, nowadays it's like, oh, we got to keep this down to like a 10, 15 minute demo max, but we were just letting people sit there for, you know, 45 minutes before we realized we needed to start handing out like time slots and stuff. It was, yeah, it was, it was harrowing, but, um, it was, uh, validating. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm super curious how, how it just felt because from the outside, I mean, that was like, a um, you know, a real surprise. People were five, six deep, just at the booth, kind of doing what you did as a kid, just watching other people play, trying to understand what the game was about. And, and you know, and certainly, you know, there was a huge amount of interest from, you know, all the business people every, all over the world. And um, how does that feel going from that stealth mode of, you know, working on the game and certainly had been showing it around to get the, to, to get the invite to, to Sweden and everything like that, but then to have the, like now it's the the hot new thing. Uh, it it felt it felt cool and a little. It's a little scary sometimes as well when a, a demo is a promise, right? And it is very easy. Um, I mean, in any creative in endeavor, to have something good happen and think this is bad. Oh no, what have I done? Uh, and it, that, that feeling throughout development. And at that point also of, okay, who, okay. Now, now people are interested in it. We've got people on the mailing list. That's great. Awesome. Good. I really hope I don't disappoint them. Uh, so yeah, um, complex emotionally for sure. Yeah. And at that point, when did you think you would ship? Did you have an idea? Um, for the longest time, Tunic was coming out next year. Uh, and when next year rolled around, it was, uh, it wasn't behind schedule because it was still coming out next year. Uh, <laughs> and that was, that happened for a little while and it, partnering with Finchy helped make that a little bit more concrete. At no point did they say, you, you've got a deadline to stick to. It's a very collaborative process coming up with good timelines for things. Um, but having that team intimately aware of where the game was and what was going on with it helped it helped the development of the game have structure, um, which it had before, but it was, you know, as things were starting to crystallize more, uh, having that sort of support to help direct the game towards launch was definitely super valuable. Cool. And I want to, I really want to start talking about the game itself a lot, but I, I also am just fascinated by the, the business stories of independent games too. How did you, you, you hooked up with Felix. How did you um, make the decision to work with a publisher and what was that like? It was a long process involving lots of like, you know, scrawl on note paper and emails back and forth and stuff. Uh, and it, so I, I'm, I like to make experiences, you know, I like to write shaders and do animations and write code. And I, um, I feel like I, I specced into lots and lots of different categories on my character sheet and my dump stat was like business relations because I'm, I, you know, I'm an anxious person and I, uh, um, 
uh, commitment is hard, you know, you're signing contracts. Oh my God. Uh, and all of that made me realize that I, if I wanted to focus on the development of the game, I would need support that did all the, not, not only the things that I knew I didn't know how to do or couldn't do, but the things that I didn't even know I, I had to do, but was not good at, um, and so partnering with Vinji made a lot of sense. At, at a certain point, it was like, oh, okay, well, should probably uh, partner up with, with some sort of publisher. And who should it be? Uh, Adam and Becca uh, Saltzman of Vinji had been in our corner for a long time, not as publishers, but just sort of fans of the game and mentors, you know, um, Adam had been checking out builds from very early and Becca had been providing um, advice on the business side for a while as well. And it just sort of made sense. It was a very organic, easy decision at that point, um, you know, like due diligence and all of that, but it, it just made sense. And it, it, uh, it was a good decision. Cool. And you, and, and, and they provided some structure for you that a publisher does and, and everything like that. So yeah, exactly. Well, cool. Well, let's let's start to talk about the game. So I'll just share uh, when I first showed it to anyone at Microsoft um, when we were talking about showing it at E3, we showed it to a room full of executives, and somebody was like, um, "People liked it." We did show it at E3; it was awesome. But uh, one of the executives was like, "It looks like Zelda with a fox. What is it?" <laughs> and and I was like, "Well, it's a little bit like Zelda with a fox." Um, but uh, um, wh what was the Impetus, why a fox? That's the first question. Uh, so way, way back at the start of this game in, in 2015, I had done a little bit of 3D modeling, um, but it was very limited. And I thought, if I'm going to make a 3D game, I'm going to have to keep it extremely simple. And so the first box was mostly designed on graph paper. You know, like, here's where the vertices are going to go, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, I, I knew that I couldn't make a full-fledged character creator. Like the, the whole idea is that you are supposed to feel like you are this character in the game somehow, right? And in order to do that, you can either have a, a, a person that might not look like you in some way, or you could abstract it and have some sort of like, you know, anthropomorphic animal character, for instance. And I, I don't think I thought very long about that before settling on a fox. In retrospect, it just sort of, I don't know, it makes sense that uh, foxes are... Uh, mischievous, um, contrasting colors, green and orange-ish, almost contrasting, almost complementary. Um, I've brought this up before, but um, the foxes, the, at least this this vision of them, are very pointy. Like there's a lot of directional um, information about where you're facing when you're doing combat. So it just sort of worked out. And it, it, I guess it turns out that foxes are pretty popular. Yeah, foxes are awesome. So the you know the the. You know, the fox is the star, but in another way of thinking about it, the real star of the game are the levels and the level design and just the world that you created. How did you, I mean, as I was playing the game, I was, I was just like, and then I'm like, at a certain point, you know, as you know, somebody who's worked in games, you start to think about like, how do they actually do this? Like, this is insane. You know, this is like so, uh, you know, uh, deep and amazing. Um, how did you start? How much of the level design was organic and grew as you built the game, and how much was pre-planned? And 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 the secondary question is just how did you start the level design, and how did you finish the level design, just tools-wise and that sort of thing? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> the all the areas in the game had been built and rebuilt many, many times before ship came around, and. Uh, it's interesting to hear you say like planned versus organic because when I when I think about sitting down and you know I got a blank sheet of paper and I got a freshly sharpened pencil I'm like time to do some level design you know start drawing big shapes it's beautiful it's perfect all right ship it that's the that's this area done like that's the that's the dream but I realized early on that it just doesn't work like that as as satisfying as it can be to create like that um, I just didn't I don't have enough like. RAM in my brain to keep all of the requirements in my mind at the same time. And so level design, a lot of the time for this game, uh, came down to very careful planning, using sort of abstract diagrams of like 
what the player knows and what sort of the equipment they'll probably have and how we want them to flow through a space. And then just piles and piles of iteration where, you know, you can build a whole level and then realize, but then when they get this, they're actually at the bottom and we want them to be at the top and they'll find their way there eventually, but they might get distracted by this spot and they're not supposed to be there yet, but we don't want to block it off because the idea is you could get there, but you're not really supposed to be. So what if we just turn the whole level upside down? And so you actually are here when you get that item. Okay. Whew. That's like, no joke, like the mental effort of like making sure that everything is internally consistent is is taxing. And then having to adjust the level geometry to do that means that you end up having levels that are real broken and gross looking for a long time, intentionally, like very rough, you know, you know, words floating in the sky that say, it'll be beautiful, trust me. Um, so that it's malleable enough that stuff can be moved around like that. And at a certain point, it's like, this is, okay, I think I have a pretty solid idea of how this is supposed to work. Let me build it fresh again. And often that works really well. Um, sometimes it's not, oh, I've got a great idea of how this is supposed to work. It's it's more along the lines of what an incredible a pile of hot garbage. Uh, I need to blow this away. Now that I have a better understanding of the requirements of this, you know, um, let me go back to the drawing board, like literally, and start sketching out what this should look like. Like, you know, the, the, the quarry, the, the, the area that eventually became the quarry was many different things before it was that, um, the area that is now the swamp slash cemetery got rebuilt many, many times. The, the requirements of sight lines and pathing and altitude and stuff like that were just a really interesting puzzle to solve that was not always super fun, but generally speaking, like pretty satisfying to see come together at the end. Cool. Do you have a favorite area in the game? Favorite area. I So there's an area that people will encounter very early on, I guess sort of at the beginning, and then, you know, you'll maybe go on a little diversion and come back. That's just called the overworld. And that's a bit of a cop out because it's you know a very large area that is sort of not quite a hub but sort of a hub, uh, and I think there was a moment late in development, like pretty close to, to launch, where I was um, outlining a document of all the secrets that are in the game so that they could be properly like QA'd, um, and you know like the community management team knew about it, so they you know could be ready to anyway all of that, and I just realized wow this is. The, the density of stuff that we've hidden here is like really high. And it was that moment where I could look at a screenshot and be like, there's at least four things in any given screenshot that is like, oh, well, I bet you, you mm, maybe later you'll figure that out. Um, and that was the point I was like, yeah, this is, this is about right. This is the this is the level of secret density that I crave um, is lots and lots of hidden stuff all over the place. That's awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about the secrets because it's just, the game is secrets upon secrets upon secrets and whether you discover them organically or find them through a guide or have a friend tell you about them, it's just the density of stuff is amazing. And I think it, delivers the amount of density of secrets and mystery that you may be expected from an NES game from reading the manual or hearing from your friends. Can, can you talk about how you, how do you, how do you suss out what the right level of density of, of secrets is? Uh, n never enough. More is always better. You can just, you just, if it, if it seems like it's overwhelming, just hide them more deviously. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is that that sort of like old school feeling of there could be something around every corner uh, feeling. And that was the sort of, in particular, the manual, making sure that it felt like it was crammed full of stuff, cool things that were staring you right in the face, um, you know, important pieces of information that were you know, in some ways critical to succeed. Maybe it's just a cool tip, but maybe it's actually something that changes your entire understanding of the world. Making sure that there was enough of that to make people um, 
feel excited about finding manual pages and discovering a new area was really important. That's awesome. The manual is just, to me, it's like the the coolest, you know, when I first saw it and got my first couple of manual pages, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Oh, it's like an old school manual. And then like, oh, there's something written here. And then you, you st- I, I'm conscious of spoilers, right? But like you start to realize just how much is in the manual. And again, how much of that was planned? How much of that came later? Uh, iteration again. So there are, I was looking through it the other day for whatever reason, but there's just pages and pages of sprawling, like, Multi multi monitor screen full diagrams of like world layout and manual layout and um, the the sort of like I, I I should post it at some point. It's this ridiculous wide document that is every single manual page, every single spread, and every single leaf. You know, because that's a, that's a consideration is that you you in the game you find manual pages that are are leaves, right? Uh, that have uh, two sides to them, two pages on each leaf, and so making sure that the pacing of discovering something at a certain point uh, has the information that you need, but maybe you don't know or didn't remember that you could turn them over, but then you get the next page and the next page will show the previous page there. And you're like, oh, what's that? And maybe that's when you discover the stuff that was on the other side of the first page. (laughs) Anyway, just having all of that with the sort of um, uh, red string and scrawl sort of uh, design doc feel to it was a, it was a long process that, that was, took a lot of fine tuning I think. And it was, I, I have to hand it to the team for, uh, I guess, enduring, um, my, uh, my, my saying, oh, it, it's, uh, we'll deal with it with the manual page. Don't worry. The manual is going to be great because it needed to be fully designed. You know, you know, every manual page place, we decide where they're going to go. Um, and the contents are laid out so we can pace when people know certain things and when certain reveals happen, which half of this revelatory spread comes first versus the other one. Um, like that all needed to be planned out before I actually like sat down and, you know, busted out Photoshop and started like doing all the layouts. Before that, it was just, you know, blank rectangles. Like you probably played early builds, Chris, where it was just a rectangle that was like, here's the page where you like discover this. There's a cool map and an illustration of the boss, whatever. Um, and yeah, I took a lot of faith, I think, uh, uh, from the team. And then that, that blitz at the end of actually building all these things definitely made it feel like it was, uh, you know, a a real thing at that point. That's awesome. The, um, obviously the, the expiration to me is like, was my favorite thing about the game. Just like finding, you know, seeing something and wanting to get there and knowing that the game was not the kind of game, it's just knowing I could get there, but knowing, is it something I need or can I just figure something out or, um, was just, it's just amazing. Uh, and, and I, I love, but obviously the game has a lot of combat too. So I think it's like, definitely, um, I want to talk about the combat and, and kind of your inspirations for the combat. Um, why don't we start there? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, when people look at the game, like you mentioned, Chris, they, they look at it and they say, ah, I recognize this, you know, you've got a sword and you've got a shield, you're exploring a sunshiny world, maybe you're dressed in green. Um, and that, that brings to mind certain stuff, but when people get hands-on, they would often say, oh, it feels like a, like a little bit of a soulsy sort of thing. And souls-like is a term that gets thrown around a lot. And, and I am a fan of those games, and there's definitely some inspiration there, um, but there are some differences. So I, I thought, well, let's, what if a Zelda game had this sort of more technical combat with like a stamina meter and a dodge roll and, you know, th- that sort of thing. Um, and early iterations of the game were a lot more in keeping with that, but later on, um, it was changed and refined a little bit. You know, the combat is uh, faster than that of those those games and so some changes had to be made there and one of them in particular was the um the movement of the fox whenever i implemented something that would restrict your options as a player it generally felt bad so oh if you're out of stamina you can't dodge if you're out of stamina you can't attack it it felt antithetical to this idea of 
I'm a little fox getting up to mischief and I have infinite energy. Uh, so the combat ended up uh, changing a little bit to reflect that. So stamina would allow you to block things. And if you ran out of stamina, you would flinch and fall over. Um, but if you wanted to, you could you know, block and dodge and, and roll all over the place. Uh, and when your stamina hit zero, you could still do nearly all of those things. But it was a uh, you had made a risk reward sort of trade off at that point where you would take a lot more damage if you got hit and you didn't have iframes, and um, I I like that because it means that you are as agile as you want to be. But if you so choose or you make some poor decisions and and back yourself into a corner, uh, you are at risk, um, and it's yeah a little bit of a risk reward thing going on there. So that in conjunction with the sort of like obliqueness. Of, of a lot of the mechanics of the game sort of is where I think that that sort of reference is drawn. That's awesome. And um, the um, I, I really want to talk about some of the accessibility options that are in the game around turning off the stamina meter or just turning off um, death entirely. You know, there's there's all this debate, angry, angry debate on the internet about, um, you know, people making their, you know, should people make their games easier? Should they not make their games easier? Um, what was your decision process like for implementing those accessibility features? Um, yeah, for sure. So the er, early on, and not even early on, throughout development, this this one of the the main ideas of the game, whether it's a um, a, a secret space thing of, oh, I, I don't know what this, I discovered something and I, I'm not really sure what it means. And now it did something. And what does that mean? Oh no. It's sort of, to me, goes hand in hand with um, combat challenge where you might encounter an enemy and say, oh, this is way too hard. I can't do it. Um, I, I need to come back later. And then it's in your mind as a big question mark. Like what's What's that enemy guarding? Or maybe you do conquer it and you get past and you think, well, I... <laughs> I fluked my way through that. I'm definitely a place where I'm not supposed to be at this point. You know, that feeling of tension, like those things in, in my mind are sort of hand in hand, like two sides of the same sort of mysterious exploration coin. Uh, and so the game is as a result, quite difficult. Um, and that's cool if you're up for that, but we realize that a lot of people aren't, you know, whether it's someone who isn't able to, you know, make split second decisions, or maybe it's, you know, someone who's just getting started playing games and doesn't know how all of that works, or just someone who's busy or someone who doesn't like combating games generally. Like there were enough use cases for what if we just let people not have to worry about the combat that it just made sense. And I don't like genuinely don't understand <laughs> internet vitriol around it generally, because in my experience, which is limited admittedly, but in my experience, if someone is especially interested in challenge, then they will, unsurprisingly, opt not to take advantage of those options. And then you have a game that they can enjoy and that other people can also enjoy. And the only reason why one person isn't going to enjoy it because the other people people person is enjoying it is um I, I don't know like maybe they should reevaluate their opinions on what makes something <laughs> good if if that's bothersome to them but anyway um so it was a very easy decision to put that in there and there are a couple of knobs to fine tune like uh or, or options to flip on and off like whether or not yeah you mentioned stamina is a consideration or whether you take damage at all yeah i i have to say as somebody who turn damage off uh, to play the game. I, I really appreciated it. And I loved the fact, I was worried when I did it. I did it, I was stuck someplace and I did it and then I just left it for the rest of the game because I was just so focused on exploration. But I was worried when I did it that the game was not going to be fun anymore. That like there would just be like, I'd just walk through these enemies. But actually it's not the case because there's still a lot of enemies who give you knockback damage and and um, even the bosses. So you, you still like, it's, you're not going to fail, but it is not in any sense a cakewalk, uh, even with damage off. Yeah, we didn't just delete the the enemies because that, like I mentioned, having this feeling of, whoa, this thing is really hard. Like, how do you communicate that while still 
allowing people to progress, even if they like don't have the dexterity or the time or whatever to do it, um, is that, yeah, you just make them hit hard, but at no point does it say you need to start over, right? You can just, you can wail on them and they can wail on you and eventually you, you will get past it. And you, you at least understand the, the, like the, the, the story has carried forward in a sense, like the story of that was a hard fight and I did it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I really appreciated that as somebody who's not great at games, you know, it was just really, um, or not great at combat. I don't know. Uh, it was, it was, it was really great. Um, I want to go back to the manual for a second. Cause I forgot to mention one of the, you know, the manual is gorgeous. It's incredible to explore. You also can't read it. Um, at least at the beginning of the game, uh, when you're getting those pages, can you talk about the, the language you created and then, and just what that process was like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I backed myself into a corner by saying that some things were two sides of the same coin, like exploration and combat, because it's not it's not a coin; it's like a three sided coin. Because because the other thing is is reading text and not understanding it completely or partially understanding it, and that again is another way I think to tripod. Is that what we're talking about now? It's not a coin; it's a tripod. The other thing that's supporting this is. Uh, hopefully is is feeling like yeah you're a stranger in a strange land you know that you're you're finding things that are not meant for you and that like we talked about at the beginning of the the, the podcast is for me at least reminds me of being a kid and flipping through a manual when i'm like i don't know five and uh having to have my imagination fill in the gaps you know i i don't i don't know what a morph ball is or whatever, you know, like that's, uh, but I can imagine as someone over there is, is playing on the, the gay boy. Um, and the, uh, the, yeah, the feeling of, of, of what could this possibly mean? I I've mentioned it in a couple other places, but I think when I was playing super Mario brothers, which we mentioned again earlier in the call, there was a moment where I, as a child found the warp zone. For those of you who don't know, it, in that game, you can sort of like go past the end of some of the levels. And it's not it's not signposted or anything like that. It's just two pieces of understanding. You know, I, I can walk on the upper part of the level and the level ends, but the upper part continues. You just sort of like, as a child, you know, the gears turn, you put those two things together and now you're in this secret room. And uh, it says, welcome to warp zone. And I... I'm pretty sure that I had never seen the word warp or zone before as a child. Um, and so it was very mysterious and exciting. Like, have I broken the game? What's going on here? And it's that same feeling of like seeing something and only partially understanding it. And the manual with its, you know, cryptic glyph language uh, helps facilitate that, hopefully at least. That's the intent where you can read it and realize that it is very earnestly trying to communicate something with you. It's doing its best. It's not trying to be oblique. It just happens to be written partially in a language you don't understand. And so you are maybe think to yourself, okay, instruction manual, I'm going to meet you halfway. I'm going to really like look at this and pour through the pages and try and understand what's going on here. And um, players of, of Tunic will hopefully be rewarded by doing that, by finding out, you know, like cool tips and important mechanics and maps and bestiaries and special techniques and all kinds of stuff like that. Were, were you someone for whom discovering the warp zone in Super Mario Brothers was um, like you discovered it? Like it wasn't something that you always knew was there that kids had told you about? Like you just, you just found it? I, I think I bumbled into it because I have memories of it. And uh, I wonder, like maybe this is the root of my core anxieties. I let the timer run out. I never found out. The first time I got there, when I was a child, I was so paralyzed that I did not do anything. And I let the timer run out. And my, my little character just perished right there. Um, and so, I, yeah, I've got this very strong emotional connection to that. That's what I think I was alone at the time. Because if I was with someone, they probably would have told me to do something. So I think I was just like, in the basement, do, 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 playing video games as a child, like a tiny baby. And yeah, found this thing. It was just like, ah, so who knew that I would try to make a video game about that moment decades later. 
It's so special. And I think that you, I, I think that something that both Fez had and that, 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 um, that Tunic has is you've given the world the opportunity to experience that moment themselves. Because I, I know, um, you know, I, I got a phone call from my son once at work and he was literally out of breath. And he was like, I was playing Mario and I found a warp zone. I don't know what it is. I took a picture of it, you know, and he used like a film camera to like take a picture because he was like, and and I, I just, I mean, it's one of the um, best moments of my life, honestly, you know, one of my favorite cherished memories is that, but that sense of just like, I found something and it's weird is, is so captured in the game and it's just such a beautiful like meaningful part of the game and so I, i'm conscious of spoilers but i want to talk about the the golden path and and seeking wisdom and and to the extent that you're comfortable talking about it talk about it <laughs> sure okay um Yes. So, uh, spoilers ahoy. I'll, I'll try to talk around it a little bit, but if you are spoiler sensitive, then maybe uh, skip forward a little bit. Um, uh, gentle podcast listener. I, my, my favorite sort of secret or discovery or whatever you want to call it is the question mark. So playing a game and seeing a closed door or the you know a stare down and and a path into the darkness that you don't know what's on the other other side of it or a mysterious obelisk on the top of a hill you know those things you know you're a dragon in the sky these things that represent um on your little mental bullet point list of things that you don't understand things to like threads to tug at like as long as it's still a thread to tug at mentally it is exciting so the the most valuable thing to me or one of the most is opening that door and having more question marks come at you, you know, opening the door and realizing, Oh, wow, there's this whole dungeon in here, this whole space with, you know, it's dark and I can't see, maybe there's a lantern somewhere. Like that's more questions, you know, um, going into an area and it being just this ridiculously hard boss. And you're like, I'm never going to beat that. But, but if I did, what would be on the other side? Who knows? Or how am I going to beat this? Do I need a special item? That's awesome. But there, there's like an S tier of that that is even more than you open the door and there's more question marks on the other side, which is you discover that there is an entirely new dimension to the world that you've already experienced. That's the situation where you are, you know, bumbling around in a game and you notice like, oh, I, I dropped a bomb and it, a, whoa, a hole appeared on the wall. There are there are holes in the wall in this game. There is, there's this whole network of secret passages that I can go through. I have no idea. Like this changes everything or making like Fez is the sort of like the Ur example of this in my mind. And if you haven't played Fez, then what are you doing? Go, go play Fez. Um, but that realization that everything you've ever seen, you can just like tilt your understanding very slightly and understand that it, it had multiple meanings the whole time. And so one of the core ideas, it's very lofty. And, and I don't know, maybe people are hearing this who understand the implementation of this in Tunic and are like, well, you are overselling this, my friend. But the hope is that that that, that is captured in Tunic where you've explored the world and you found some things. And like I said earlier, the, whoa, this was here the whole time. The TM, the video game uh, is, is captured. And, you know, I just, I want, I want that feeling in people where your heart swells or like skips a beat or something. And you're like, Oh, right. And yeah, that's, that's the, that's just the best. And I really hope that people get that when, when they play tunic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, they have, right. It's clear. It's clear to see from, from all the feedback that, that people have really gotten that. And, you know, I, I've, finish the game a couple times and and i know there's still plenty that i didn't that i didn't see um um oh, so many questions i have but let's talk about audio for a second because we've been neglecting it we won't talk about secrets but let's just talk about what the the, the both the the audio design and the soundtrack have gotten like so much praise um how did you work with the audio folks and what was the process of 
doing the audio. Uh, I was looking through some old prototypes recently and uh, got a chance to listen to the sound effects that I made at the very beginning of development, which at the time I thought were like, these are pretty okay. But I, I, I knew that I needed help with that. So I, like I said before, there were some things that I knew I didn't know how to do and some things that I didn't know that I didn't know how to do. And, and one of those things or two of those things was um, sound design in general and music. Uh, and so it didn't take long before I partnered with Power Up Audio, who are a, a video game focused audio studio from Vancouver. Uh, in particular, Kevin Regami, who's the audio director on the game. And you, you kind of can't think of a better person to be on the team than Kevin, because he is a, a, a world-class audio designer. Um, he loves secrets. He made an entire game about hiding secrets in audio. And he likes speedrunning. And the speedrunning community has been amazing with Tunic. And, and we sort of like tried to you know, cater some of the things. It's a very speed runnable game. And so we tried to make sure that, you know, we had some sort of representation on the, on the project and, and Kevin was able to do that. Uh, and so, yeah, he just made uh, absolute magic happen there. And I, it's, uh, this happens a few times in development, but the most powerful I think is when it, it's a feeling of, wow, it feels like a real video game now. And, and when Kevin would be like, all right, I added a bunch of sounds and I'm going in and implementing them. And I'm like, this was just a animation before, you know. Now it now it's an attack, you know. Now it's something meaty. It's cool. The um, the sounds of discovering secrets in this game, the sounds of of uh, just exploring the world and interacting with everything. Like anyway, it's I I am blessed to have worked with uh, with Power Up and and continue to do so. Um, it's tremendous and similarly tremendous is the. Uh, the music. So I listened to the music of Life Formed well before I started work on the game. There's a, an album called Immerse, which is to me like when I when I listen to that, I don't I, I I hear the game that I thought Tunic would be in my mind at the beginning, which is in some ways similar, in some ways not, but it still captures this this beautiful feeling of you know exploring the countryside and having there be just secrets around every corner and just like a, a boundless energy for running around and you know exploring so yeah you should definitely check that out that's um that was and i reached out to um to life formed um terence lee and uh showed him a, a prototype and he said yeah i want to make a soundtrack for your game and so he and um uh, janice kwan made the the soundtrack for the game which is available now um, check it out, uh, lifeform.com, I think is accurate. Um, and uh, give it a listen because, yeah, I, I, I feel um, able to gush about it because I had basically nothing to do with it aside from some some general direction. But, yeah, the, the way Tunic sounds is uh, tremendous. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's just um, – it's one of the things about the game that it just really stands out. So everyone should go buy the soundtrack. Yeah. You mentioned obviously the collaborators you had on sound. You, how, how many people in total worked on the game? And and I would love to just learn a little bit more about the um, the development process itself. Was it fully distributed? Were you all in one place? Like how did that go? Uh, very distributed. So I I'm the core developer on um, j just about all aspects of it, um, aside from from audio, um, but. It was. It's not a. It's not a solo team. It's not a solo team plus, plus audio. There's definitely help as well. So, um, I mentioned uh, business help from Felix Kramer and uh, Rebecca and Adam Saltzman at Finji and their team there. Um, also, as we got, I say close to the end of development. It was you know two years, but um, Eric Billingsley um, also came on to help do uh, things like. You know, de decorating the world and you know putting finishing touches on stuff, placing blades of grass just so, um, but also ended up being um, a pretty important part of the team doing like uh, you know visual effects and adding polish to a bunch of places and doing like programming and bug reporting, bug bug fixing and stuff like that. So Eric was a big help also, um, and there on, on top of all of this was uh, help from people all around the world. 
doing things like, you know, helping uh, porting and optimization and, um, you know, Finji's QA team and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, early on, there was this notion of, you know, there's this guy in Halifax, Nova Scotia, making a game all by himself. Can you believe it? Um, which we've tried to shake uh, a lot over the years. Um, because it, it is that is not the case. There have been a lot of people that have touched this game over the years. Uh, but generally, it's all been uh, w when we are together, it is a special occasion. And by, yeah, by, by, a, by a wide margin, we have not, quote unquote, all been together at the same time. Um, so maybe someday we can do that. Right on. Yeah, I think the notion, the, the notion of the sole game maker who does it all themselves is both like, usually false and hopefully maybe also kind of going away from popular culture um it, it really is usually a team effort but as you're the core developer i'm super curious what's your kind of ideal uh, development environment is it a cafe is it quiet like what what space uh do you get into that makes you um like most creative or, or when you're really pounding stuff out? Uh, depends on what I'm working on, I think. So there's the, like, I am in programming mode and I must have all of the, the brain power available to me, you know, absolute silence. Um, and, and just like as much, you know, notebook paper that I can get my hands on. Um, that that's one side of things. Um, there's the, uh, pacing around the kitchen, solving design problems sort of situation where you're just sort of talking to yourself about all the different bits and pieces. Um, every now and again, I'll do a cafe thing. Usually that's, um, uh, doing visual designs for elements, you know, like how should this door open? How should this animation play out? Or doing storyboards or stuff like that. I seem to recall having a lot of memories of that, but generally speaking, it's just, um, you know, a nice cup of coffee, uh, some either, either sunshine or some nice pensive rain out the window. Um, and, uh, yeah, just being able to, to go at it. The, the, um, the one thing that I did realize is the value of having the game in other people's brains was something that I sort of missed from working with teams earlier in my life. And it wasn't until I, you know, sat down with, with Finji and was able to just sort of, I remember like sitting down and explaining the game from front to back. And at the end, having someone intelligently ask questions and like bring up new design problems and potential solutions and stuff. I was like, oh, wow, right. That's what it's like to work with a team. You know, you've got other cool brains with their their power, you know, pointed at this problem that you're working on. It was very cool. And I I do appreciate that as well. So the it's not it's not literally absolute silence all the time. It is absolutely wonderful to be able to pull your head up and talk to human beings every now and again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you need that combo. But I'm always I'm always curious because there's some developers who to thrive in a noisy environment. Some want it dark, some want it bright. And it's just fascinating to me the, the different ways that people get into the zone where they're, yeah, yeah. Where they're able to, to type yeah. uh, or to, to work. Um, I think we're just about done. I have, um, oh, well, actually we're not, we're not just about done because you mentioned speed running and I want to talk about it. Like the, the kind of the influence of speed running on the game. Um, how did that how did that come in there as i alluded to a little bit before there's lots of different ways to approach tunic you can you know bumble into places where you're not supposed to be you can realize later wait a second i this is connected to that place i could have gone this way instead and then i'd be in this area this end game area way sooner than i i'm quote unquote supposed to be what what is what are the implications of that like can i start this over and and get this item before this item, maybe. Um, that sort of, wait a second, let's turn this game on its head. Um, I'm not strictly gated by item progression. Like that that sort of feeling was really important from the very beginning. This, this idea of, um, you know, f firm gates, you know, you've got a hard gate, like you must have the red key to open the red door sort of thing. Uh, and soft gates, which is, you know, we gently encourage people to do this first not a lot, a whole lot of text in the game. It's hard to do that, but having firm gates of 
we're going to gently direct p- players away from this. But if they if they know something special, they can they can do this out of order. Um, ha- having that be part of the game, just for for non speed players, was important from the very start. But it turns out that that's very cool for sequence breaking, um, uh, different routing, that sort of thing for for speedrunners. And so, uh, as development continued, we would always ask ourselves. What would this mean for speedrunners? And when it came time to fix a bug, or at least look at a bug more closely, there was a question: Wait, would this be really cool for speed tech? And there are plenty of things that we thought no, we just can't. We this would break things for non-speed players more often than we would like, so we're not going to include that. But there are other circumstances where we leaned into things. You know, realizing, hey, did you know that? You know, concept A and concept B can be put together into concept C. You might only use that zero to one times in your playthrough of the game, maybe. Um, but if you're a speedrunner and you know how to do it, maybe you can do some really interesting stuff and you know, get into places that you again are not not just quote unquote not supposed to get into, but like not supposed to get into. Asterix, like we know about it. There's a sound effect when you do it, but um, uh, that sort of thing I think makes it more interesting i say i i think like i'm going on what other people have said like um uh, uh kevin or jonah on the qa team who also does speed running um they've been invaluable in saying things like you know this this is where you need to focus your attention for speedrunners. have there been either speedrunners or just standard players who have done things that you didn't expect where you're like oh yeah absolutely like a lot of people will um i mean Semi spoilers. There's things you collect in the game, important MacGuffin esque quest items, and a lot of people collect them in a non standard order, uh, which was a little bit surprising to me. Like I obviously knew it was possible, like oh you can get here, but it. I, I guess what I didn't anticipate is that people would uh, explore as thoroughly as they did, which allowed them to you know get item number two before they would get item number one. Um, even though, yeah, that's totally permissible. It's just that I was, I was expecting it to go the other way, but um, I, I love that. Um, and the thing that I love even more is that when people when people do it in an alternative order or maybe even the expected order, th- they come to realize how the game works and think, but wait, no, hmm, hold on. Like I've heard people say that when they start the game over, it's a different experience because they know things now and they can do things that, you know, are, are entirely different from their first playthrough. Yeah, uh, I, I've I've had that experience where you you do, and you also get the experience of, you know, the first time I went from one place to another place, it took me a super long time, and then you there later in the game, and you're through it in like forty five seconds, and you're like, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> are there secrets in the game that people haven't found yet? Hmm. People have been extremely diligent, let's say, about finding things. And they found things much uh, faster than uh, I, I might have thought. There are there are things like, oh, you know, what's the deal with this secret language? Does it mean anything? Some people had figured that out, you know, even before the game launched. Um, but the some of the deeper secret stuff it took a little while for people to uncover um but it was it was really fun to to watch that happen i tried to keep you know arm's length from everything and and just sort of like peek in around again to see what people are up to um however i think probably forever there will be things in the game that are just for me if that makes sense yep um secrets that aren't really secrets it's not it's not hidden in the game code you know it's it's meaning and um context that is just 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 out of reach i think you know what i mean um uh so yeah there's that um there are i think one or two things that i have in mind that maybe i haven't heard people mention explicitly but maybe i just haven't paid attention uh but yeah that's um it, it the most the most validating thing about all of that is that people are willing to do it and that the idea of layers upon layers of secrets landed for folks yeah it's awesome i'm still i'm not done playing the game so i can't <laughs> wait to find there's a room that i need to fill that i haven't filled yet so ah uh, yes i think i know the room you're talking about 
So I'll, I'll ask uh, the last question. Well, the second to last question. The last question is going to come when we stop recording because there's one treasure chest I can't get. <laughs> oh, I got you. I got you. Um, uh, um, but everybody who's finished the game wants a printed manual. And also everybody who's finished the game understands why a printed manual could also be problematic because collecting the manual pages is, is a process of the game. T tell me there'll be some way to get a printed manual. Uh, I, I don't think we have any official uh, merch announcements at this time. Um, however, you are, perhaps unsurprisingly, not the first person to suggest this. All right, that's fair. I mean, and maybe maybe you could get a to you could update the game, get a code, and you need the code to get the man, you know, something. Whoa. Like, <laughs> could be fun. Um, but cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, it was just great to learn more about um, the game, learn more about your working style, and learn more about the process that it's come. And, um, you know, I know, I assume you're going to take a little bit of a break now, but we're super excited to see what comes next. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun.